Hi, I'm David Baker from the University of Washington, and today I'm going to give you an introduction to protein design. Proteins uh, function by folding to unique native structures, and some representative native structures are shown on this slide. Uh, proteins are encoded in genes in our genomes. Each gene encodes one protein, and the proteins fold up to these unique nat native structures in order to carry out their biological function. Native structures of proteins are likely the lowest energy states for the protein sequence. So for each protein, each amino acid sequence of a protein, uh, there corresponds an energy landscape, of which I've shown a cartoon here. And there are many different possible conformations a protein can have. Uh, the native state of a protein is the lowest energy state, what I've shown uh, here. There are two research problems I'm going to describe today. The first problem is the problem of predicting protein structure. In our genomes, we have on the order of 30,000 different genes. Each encodes a unique protein. And each organism that exists on Earth has a different genome with a different complement of genes and hence uh, proteins. So there's a general problem of predicting what the structures and functions of these proteins are. So on the top, the top arrow is, shows going from an amino acid sequence to a three-dimensional structure. Um, so in this case, we have a fixed amino acid sequence, and we have to find the lowest energy structure. The inverse problem is the protein design problem, which I'm going to focus on today. In this case, we don't start with a naturally occurring amino acid sequence or a naturally occurring structure. Rather, we start with a brand new structure that we'd like to make, and we go backwards to find an amino acid sequence which will fold up to that structure. Both of these problems, the protein structure prediction problem and the protein design problem, are very hard problems. And I'm going to tell you why in the next few slides. The first reason they're hard is that a polypeptide chain can have a very large number of different possible conformations. For each side chain, in a, for each amino acid in a protein chain, um, there are many rotatable bonds, as shown in this schematic. So each side chain, each amino acid, can have on the order of uh, three different conformations. So if you have a 100 residue protein, that means you have three conformations for the first one, three for the second one, and the number of possible conformations total you get by multiplying together all of these possibilities. So it's three times three times three um, uh, up to 100 times. So more generally, if you have, if n res is the number of amino acids in the protein, the number of different conformations is 3 to that power, so 3 to n res. And this is an astronomical number. The second reason that these problems are hard, in particular the design problem is hard, is there's also an astronomical number of protein sequences. So again, the first residue can be any one of the 20 different amino acids. The second position can, again, can also be any one of the 20 amino acids. So the number of possible sequences is 20 times 20 times 20 to the n res power, which is, again, a very, very large number. The third reason that these are hard problems is that uh, we need to find the lowest energy structure for a sequence, for example, in the protein structure prediction problem. It's hard because calculating energies is, is difficult to do accurately because there are many Proteins have many, many atoms, and they're surrounded by water molecules, uh, which also have many atoms. Each, each water molecule only has, has three atoms, but there are many, many water molecules. So we need to calculate energies accurately uh, for systems that have many thousands of atoms. So now what I'm going to do is tell you about how we go about uh, solving these problems. So to search through the possible, set, the possible conformations for a protein, we try and mimic the actual folding process. And um, here you see uh, an, uh, a movie depicting uh, the computer calculation. This is using the Rosetta methodology, which um, my group and others have been developing for the last 15 years or so. We try and simulate the actual process of folding so we can sample through um, and find the lowest energy structures much more quickly than we could if we were sampling all possible configurations which is essentially impossible. Um, so this calculation that you see here is, um, takes 
not much longer than it takes you to watch it to actually calculate, to actually carry out on a computer. Um, the challenge is that um, every uh, folding calculation like this, or nearly every one, will end up in a different final structure. So what we need to do is many, many of these independent calculations um, uh, to build up a picture of um, what that energy landscape looks like and where the lowest energy structure is. Uh, the second problem that I mentioned, searching through the space of sequences, uh, we handle in, uh, as shown on this in this animation, uh, starting with a protein backbone for which we want to find a very low energy sequence. We, we carry out a calculation in which at each step we're randomly substituting in a different amino acid uh, identity and different side chain confirmation for that amino acid at a randomly selected position. Uh, we can do these substitutions very rapidly. We evaluate the energy and we accept the change if the energy got lower. So in this way we can scan through a very, a very large number of possible sequences and quite rapidly identify the lowest energy sequence for a structure. The third problem uh, the uh, necessar necessity to calculate energies accurately, um, uh, we solve in the following way. We use a model in which we try and capture the detailed interactions between atoms as accurately as we can. So we have um, their terms in the energy function that favor uh, close atomic packing, but the atoms can't be overlapping. They penalize the burial of polar atoms that would, that would like to interact with solvent they penalize the burial of such atoms away from water. They favor the formation of hydrogen bonding interactions between polar atoms. We model the electrostatic interactions, the, the favorability of positive and negative charges to be close together. And we also model the, the bending preferences of the polypeptide chain. So given um, what I've told you, the algorithms for searching for the lowest energy structure for a given amino acid sequence, that was in the movie where the protein sequence, protein structure was moving around, um, uh, and the algorithm for searching for the lowest energy sequence for a fixed structure. There are again two problems which um, uh, we can approach. The first problem is the structure prediction problem, where again we are going from genome sequences to um, try to pr starting from those and try and predicting the structures and functions of the proteins that are encoded by those genes. The second problem is the design problem where we start with something completely new that we would like to make and um, work backwards to, for, to identify a sequence um, which is predicted to fold up to that structure. And for the remainder of this talk, I'm going to describe some examples of the uh, second type of calculation, the design calculation. First, I want to give you an overview of the different types of protein structures found in nature. There, um, in the top left, is a depiction of uh, a globular protein where um, the, uh, the secondary structure elements, the alpha helices and the beta sheets, come together and to form a roughly spherical protein with hydrophobic residues buried in the interior. Um, and it's the burial of those hydrophobic residues away from solvent which stabilizes the protein. On the right is um, a protein that's consisted of long helices packed together um, uh, to make, for example, in the case of what's shown, a channel protein. Um, in the lower left is a uh, repeat protein in which a very simple module is repeated over and over and over again to make a long filament. And then finally, on the bottom right uh, is a small protein which is held together with disulfide bonds, which are uh, shown in yellow. And nature accomplishes all of the, the great diversity of biological functions in our bodies and in all living things through different, um, by utilizing these different types of proteins in different circumstances where each one is most appropriate. So what I'm going to tell you to describe now is um, our efforts to design ideal versions of these types of, these classes of proteins. Not any, not a protein that exists in nature but sort of like the platonic ideal of a globular protein or a repeat protein, um, in contrast to what's uh, been um, come through evolution has been the result um, of natural selection, so random amino acid substitutions, then selection. 
uh, the process that, and so what the result is, the proteins you actually get have a lot of history in them. And they may have initially been, in, been functioned in one way, and then they were co-opted for something else. So each protein has a lot of idiosyncrasies because of its history. What I'm going to now describe to you is taking what we've learned about these classes of proteins and the algorithms I described to make, again, sort of idealized protein structures which are free of those types of idiosyncrasies. Um, and the way these this, this works is I've outlined how the calculations, how we calculate a sequence, which is predicted to fold up to a given structure. Um, but that's just the first step. The next step is, uh, since we've designed the protein, uh, we know what its amino acid sequence is, because we came up with that amino acid sequence. From the amino acid sequence, we can work back to the DNA sequence. Uh, that's using the genetic code, which was worked out in the 1960s. Once we know the DNA sequence, we can um, write down, um, uh, we can um, essentially buy or make very easily in a lab a, a synthetic piece of DNA that encodes this protein. So the protein we've designed on the computer will have never existed in nature, something completely new. Um, and the real, real miracle of this is that it's so easy to manufacture DNA these days that we can, for any crazy protein we design on the computer, we can very, very easily uh, make a gene that encodes that, uh, that protein. And once we have that gene, we can make the protein in the laboratory um, uh, by putting the gene into bacteria, uh, growing up the bacteria. We can extract the protein out. And then we can determine uh, whether that protein folds up to the structure that we designed. Um, and we can also measure other properties of the protein. So what I'm going to tell you about are, uh, are several design calculations. We set out to make a brand new protein that was an idealized version of what exists in nature. We, uh, we did, carried out the design calculation. We designed a gene encoding the design protein. We put it into bacteria, purified the protein, and then solved the structure. And so I'm going to be showing you the design models and then the crystal structures of those designs that we determined experimentally. So the first example is um, of the class of globular proteins, which are composed of regular secondary structure elements surrounding a hydrophobic core. Um, when, after we do the design calculation, where we come up with a sequence that's predicted to um, adopt the structure, and the two structures I'm talking about here are the ones that are shown under the design column on this slide. They're, uh, again, they're idealized, so all the helices are perfect helices, the strands are perfect yeah, strands, and the loops are very regular. Um, there's one more step. We take advantage of the protein structure prediction calculation I described. So we take those sequences, and we send them out to volunteers all around the world who participate in a project called Rosetta at Home. And these volunteers uh, predict what the structure is of, of that sequence. They search for the lowest energy state of that sequence. And in the plots on the left, uh, you see many, many red dots. Each red dot is the result of a different Rosetta at Home volunteer. On the y-axis is the energy that's calculated by r r the Rosetta program that's running on their computer. And on the x-axis is how far away that, that low energy structure they found was from the structure we are trying to make, the one that's in the design column. And you can see, first of all, how big and complicated the space is by the fact that um, many of these lowest energy structures that are found are very far away from this structure that we're targeting. So the x-axis is root mean square deviation in, um, in the atomic coordinates. So, uh, so these structures on the right of these plots are 10 angstroms. Each, each atom is, on average, 10 angstroms away from where it was supposed to be in the design model. Um, so you can see that different people land in different local minima on the landscape. It's different ones of those bumps or those wells that I showed in that schematic near the beginning. But what you can see is true for both of these sequences is that the lower the energy, that's again on the y-axis, the lower the energy, the, the more the structure tends toward the um, design model. And so there's almost a funnel shape to these plots where uh, as you go to lower and lower RMSD going left, the energy gets lower and lower. So the lowest energy structures found by our Rosetta volunteer, uh, Rosetta at home volunteers, who really play a critical role in our research, the lowest energy structures are almost identical to the design model. When we see this property, which is the one that we are looking for, uh, we then uh, manufacture a gene synthetic piece of DNA that encodes the design, we make it in the lab, we, and then we solve the structure, in this case by nuclear magnetic resonance with uh, colleagues um, uh, 
uh, in the uh, NESG Structural Genomics Consortium. And on the right, you see uh, the column marked NMR shows the experimentally determined structure. And you can see it's very similar to the, the design models in the second column. And then on the far right uh, are um, superpositions, uh, blow up superpositions of the design model and the experimental structure. And they show that the side chains in these designs are actually, are, are in are actuality where we designed them to be. So we've been able to make um, such structures almost pretty routinely now. So we can make brand new globular protein structures like this um, uh, quite effectively. In fact, a new student coming to my laboratory typically is assigned the project of making up a brand new protein structure and proving that the design, designing it and then making it, characterizing the design in the laboratory. Now, um, we can get to larger structures in this way. Um, we, have the, we can make these ideal, platonic ideals of globular proteins. And then we can start, we can put them together to make larger and more complex structures. So this shows an example of taking two of the two idealized building blocks we'd solve the structure of, fusing them together. And then the lower panel on the left is the design model, and the right is the crystal structure. So again, this is a completely made up protein. Um, but uh, when we solve its structure experimentally, it comes out exactly as we designed it. Um, now, the second class of proteins I described are not globular. They're not spherical. They can be long and elongated. And this is actually a protein that's very close to my heart because I designed it myself. Uh, this protein, a schematic of it is shown on the top right. Um, this is composed of 80 residue helices. And I made it taking advantage of the Francis, uh, equations that Francis Crick worked out where by um, a backbone structure can be described by a small number of parameters. And I can make many, many different such structures by sampling through different possibilities for these parameters. And I do that, and then I design each possibility and choose the lowest energy structures. Uh, when this protein is um, manufactured in the lab, uh, when it was manufactured, uh, I did some initial tests and found it was very stable. Um, and then Joe Rogers, a graduate student in England, uh, was asking me for a, a protein to do uh, experiments on. So I sent him this protein. And he sent back uh, this result, which is really quite remarkable. Um, uh, you have, in order to unfold this protein, uh, you have to add extremely high amounts of a chemical denaturant called guanidine. That's on this plot on the left. Um, and uh, the unfolding, you can see that on the, um, these lines, uh, as you add more guanidine are pretty flat. And then at very high concentrations, over 7 molar, the protein starts to unfold, but only really does this at very high temperature. So this is something that's simply not seen for naturally occurring proteins. Uh, these design proteins can be more ideal, so much more stable. And when the crystal structure was solved of this protein, it was found to be nearly identical to the design model. So we can make this class of proteins also. I mentioned uh, a repeat proteins. That was a third class. And, um, We've also been able to make idealized versions of these type of proteins. So um, on, the, on the second column here, you see a protein, you see a repeated protein that goes on indefinitely. Um, and on the left is a crystal comparison of the design model in red to the crystal structure in gray. You can see they're nearly identical. Um, and on the right, you see another example of, a, of, of an infinitely extending repeat protein where we've made one sub-segment sub of it in the lab. And you again see that the crystal structure is nearly identical to the design model. So we're very excited about these as the basis for new types of new nanomaterials. We can make rods, straight rods, and curved rods, and start building things out of them. Um, and the final class of proteins, uh, those small disulfide bonded proteins, are very interesting because they could form the basis of new types of therapeutics because they're very small and easy to make. And um, here, uh, this shows examples of, um, this is work by Vikram Mulligan, a postdoc in the lab, uh, where he's designed very short peptides that are predicted to fold up to uh, unique structures. And there are three examples in the top row of the slide of designs he made. Then below that are NMR structures of these peptides when they're actually made uh, in the lab. And again, these peptides um, come out with very, very similar structures to the design models. So what I hope I've shown you today is uh, I've given you, um, explained uh, something about how, uh, about the protein structure prediction uh, problem, the protein design problem, 
I've told you how we go ab about approaching these problems, and then I've shown you that we can start to design sort of idealized versions of the different classes of proteins uh, that are found in nature. And uh, these proteins are likely will be the basis for, uh, for designing a whole new world of functional proteins uh, to solve modern day problems. Um, and I'll talk about that in, a, in another iBio uh, seminar. And I want to acknowledge uh, the fantastic people who have um, actually done most of this work. So Nobu and Rie Koga uh, developed um, these uh, rules for making idealized protein structures. And I showed you, uh, took you through the design of two of their structures. Uh, Vikram Mulligan, I mentioned, did the design cyclic peptide work. Uh, TJ Brunette, uh, Brunet, uh, Posu Huang, and Fabio uh, did the work on the uh, repeat proteins. And um, uh, yeah, and thank you for your attention.